Hey everybody, Kenny here. So in this video, I want to make this a resource that you can use to help you pick which character you want to start with in Octopath Traveler 2. To help in this, I'm going to be ranking them from the most difficult to start with to the easiest to start based on various factors. However, I will not be going over any story details, so you don't need to worry about any spoilers there. I will also be placing timestamps in the description so that you can easily just skip around to whichever character you're most interested in picking out. And as a disclaimer, I will not be covering this game at release. This is going to be the only video that I post on Octopath Traveler 2 for quite some time since I'm still making my way through Onanaki and after Onanaki I'm going to be playing Chain Echoes and I don't play turn-based RPGs back to back. So I'll be playing something else after Chain Echoes that I don't know what it is yet. So I won't be playing Octopath Traveler 2 until after whatever game is after Chain Echoes. So it's going to be quite a while until I get around to this game. With that said, let's get started. First off, I'm going to be showing the warrior. However, this is going to be a controversial pick because unlike every other character here, I did not actually play through the demo with the warrior. And the reason for that is when I was looking at these little planetary things, the like little cards that pop up when you hover over the, the different heroes. When I got to the warrior, I saw that this character actually gets a unique skill system that no one else gets. And because of that, since it's the only new system in the game, it immediately made it that this is going to be the character that I will be playing as when I eventually play it. And since uh, with all of these, I just I skipped through the, the story for everything so that I wouldn't spoil myself. For this one, I didn't even want to mechanically be spoiled with how this works. But based on my experience with everyone else, I will say that I think that I'm right in putting the warrior at this spot, mostly because if he's anything like the warrior from the first game, then he will not have any elements, like he's only going to have weapon skills, which means that there's going to be entire types of enemies that he will not be able to break. And even if they balance the opening section for this character so that you always run into enemies that have a weapon weakness that the warrior can exploit. I'm pretty sure that it's going to still be a pretty rough experience because if you were looking here, this is showing where everyone is on the map and the warrior is all the way over here. So they're going to have a time getting to where everyone else is, whereas everyone else, they can pretty much go, oh, I'm just going to go straight to this character or I'm going to go straight to this character over here. Like, obviously, like, you know, the most efficient route, so you can see just by looking at the map, you know, Dancer going down, you get a whole party pretty quick, and you don't have to, like, run through any extraneous areas to get a full party going. Uh, same with Scholar over here, or if you wanted to start, you know, as the hunter heading up towards the Scholar. You know, either way, like, you know, you'd get a whole group going pretty quick. But for the Warrior, like, they're going to have to go through an entire region just to get to their first party member. So I think I'm right in placing the Warrior this low and just to uh, go into that the system thing a little more so basically in Octopath 2 there are kind of limb break type things that they added for each character called latent powers and for the warrior their latent power is that they can use these weapon skills that they learned from I don't know like I like guess people that they dueled with in town that's my guess on how it's gonna work so it's kind of like if you've ever played any of the Final Fantasy games that have blue mages in them. And I'm thinking like uh, it's going to be something like that. Like it's going to be basically blue magic, but for martial skills instead of like monster abilities. And that's that's the main reason why I, I'm holding off on playing as this character because I want that to be a fresh experience for me. Because, you know, it could be terrible. It could be absolute trash, that system. It could be that like each of these characters that you learn these things from aren't any better than just, you know, doing a full... You know three bp boost to just attack with your weapon that's entirely possible and i know that but it's a new system and to me that's what's most important in any rpg i don't care about things like like i like stories you know i love i've finished almost 100 fantasy books in the last couple years 
Like, you know, like I love stories. You know, I finished over 100 RPGs in general. Like, uh, I, I just, I like systems more than I like stories. And so, to me, the thing I don't want spoiled is how this system works. Even though, in terms of story, this is the character that I was the least interested in when the game was originally announced. Because I do not like edgelord characters as my protagonist. I'd rather have some happy-go-lucky character as my main person. Because if you have a happy character as the character that you are playing as, then it helps to inform you know, your kind of, not thought process, but your mood, I guess, as you're playing through the game. Because if, they, if they're a gloomy Gus, then you're going to be looking at things far more negatively because that's the way everything's going to be presented to you. You know, this guy, you know, if it's a negative character, then they're going to be approaching everything in a negative way. And then you as the player are going to subconsciously be, you know, internalizing that. And you're going to be seeing these things in a negative way. So, you know, I don't like characters like this. You know, like the warrior, the scholar, the thief, and uh, the apothecary. Like, you know, those were the characters that I, like, right off the bat, I was like, okay, I don't want to play as those characters because, you know, they look gloomy. They look like they're not going to be the characters you want to play as. And unfortunately... By doing this, they made it that I now have to play as the guy who, <laughs> as my protagonist, I have to play as the guy that I wanted pretty much the least as my protagonist. <laughs> yeah, so that's all I can say about the warriors since I didn't actually play as them. Moving on. So next up is the scholar. And as I mentioned when talking about the warrior, you know, this is a character that is just a super edgelord, which is why I automatically had them ranked pretty low. And then when I played as them, and then I played as everyone else, it just bottomed them out completely. Like, this is not a good character to start as. First off, this is important, during a large part of the tutorial, well, prologue, I should say, not tutorial, this character does not have access to their skills. And if you played the first game, you know that each character has what are called, like, role actions. So things that they can do... Like when they're in town talking to people. And what the scholar can do is he can pick fights in order to get items. But think about that first thing I said. They don't have access to their skills. You have to do these fights as the mage character without any skills if you want to get some items. And there are no items actually worth getting, meaning that you have access to this feature that is worthless to you. Because it's not worth it to spend your time fighting these enemies to get a healing grape or because you know because by the time you're done with the fight to get the healing grape you're probably going to have to have used a healing grape because <laughs> these are very difficult fights for a character that is not meant to be the guy who's hitting things <laughs> he's meant to be using the elements that he has access to to exploit enemy weaknesses but you can't do that because they don't have access to that during this part of the game <laughs> But eventually, during their prologue, they will get access to a heal bot character, or at least assist in keeping them up. Which, unfortunately, aside from the fact that you know they need to have this heal bot, like for keeping them healed up as they go through their prologue adventure, they don't have any any means within their kit to be able to restore their SP, which is the resource that they use to cast their spells. And their spells are very expensive. This character has very expensive skills. So when you eventually stack up about 30 SP, which uh, unlocks your ability to see the available abilities for each class with each character, the top skill for you to invest in, in as far as I'm concerned, is to get the Analyze skill. And the reason to get the Analyze skill isn't for the reason that you would get it in the last game, where it was something that, you know, you wanted to know how much HP the enemies had and things like that. It's because you don't want to take guesses as this character. With the other characters, you know, taking guesses on what the weaknesses might be isn't a big deal. But none of them have this large of an SP cost to be able to test whether or not it's worth it to use it. So you actually have to spend rounds analyzing enemies you get their weaknesses, so you know that you're actually exploiting 
a weakness that they have that you are capable of exploiting. And obviously, like you know, like with the stick, and that's an easy test for you to do. You can just hit them, and that's fine. No harm, no foul with that. It's free to do. But you know, you don't want to be spending 14 SP to find out that this enemy was not weak against fire. You know, you don't want to be spending that much just to find that out. So analyze is a a must-have for this character because you need to know so you don't end up out of mana before you even get to the boss. Yeah. And some items to look out for while you're making your way through the Scholar's Prologue. As soon as you get down into this kind of, I guess, underground dungeon part of the prison, right behind the stairs here, follow along this path and you will find the chest that has a center staff in it, which will give you a little more attack power and a decent amount of extra elemental attack strength. And then when you go down to the level right below that, behind the stairs on that level, you'll find another chest that has an ancient necklace in it, which increases your SP a bit, which, you know, is definitely good for this character. But as I mentioned, you know, this is a hard one, a hard one scenario. So I definitely recommend like doing a little bit of grinding, you know, level up at least once before like once you get to the first save point in this dungeon, I recommend you know just you know fight a little just to be able, like and honestly I don't even mean to fight a little for the levels. Fight a level a little just so that you level you level up and are able to be fully restored by the time you get to the boss fight for this character. Because you don't want to go in there with half eight, with half health and <laughs> and low SP. When you get out of the prison area, out on the bluff here, there's going to be another chest you're going to be able to find. Just up this path, and you'll get a magic nut from in there. And that's basically it for any any items that you might want to come across. If you were to do enough grinding to get 100, 100 JP to be able to unlock their next skill, then I would recommend picking up the Elemental Barrage, since... Even though like it won't choose a element that the enemy is weak against, it is still an option to be able to break enemies with elemental resistances since it can hit multiple times. And it's cheaper than your other spells. And by getting that, you also gain access to the Scholar's first support skill, which is the worst thing that any character could get at the start of a game like this. Octopath Traveler and Octopath Traveler 2 use random encounters so that you are strong enough by the time you get to the first boss encounter or like to your next boss encounter to be able to triumph using your using the stats that you should have accrued along the way you know gaining enough money to be able to buy the things you need gaining enough AP to unlock the skills you need gaining enough XP to get you know the high enough stats to be able to survive but for some reason they thought that the character that already has the hardest time should also get a support skill that reduces the encounter rate by unlocking the first two skills with this character whatever order you chose choose to do them in you will unlock a support skill that lets you reduce the encounter rate thereby making the game even harder for yourself because the fastest you're going to be getting levels is at the beginning so you're going to be fighting less often and gaining less levels so by the time you reach the other characters, they're going to be even weaker than you and just make the game harder from that point on. <laughs> like, I don't understand why they would want this character to have this. Or, I mean, actually, no, here's the thing. Like, I'm fine with this character having this if it showed up as a later support skill. Like, if it showed up, like, as, like, the third, like second or third support skill, then I'd be okay with it. Because by then, you will have probably hit the point where you're not gaining a level like every couple fights. But why? when it's still the point in the game where you're getting, you know, because like, the first hour of the game, you're going to level up about 10 times in the first hour of the game, you know, easily 10 times. Well, I, well yeah, so let, let me let me put some context to that. So the first hour of the game, not counting any story stuff. Now, I, as I mentioned, I skipped all of the story stuff because I didn't want to have any of those actual sp uh, story stuff spoiled, uh, spoiled for me. 
So I don't know any of the actual character motivations or anything. But like you know, like in just like not counting however long any of those actual scenes are, in your first hour of actual gameplay where you're actually running around and able to go into dungeons and out into the field, you know, like you most likely will have leveled up about ten times. But if you're not fighting as often, then you're not going to. <laughs> Which makes absolutely no sense to do. Anyways, that's going to be it for the Scholar. Moving on. Moving on to the Thief. Now, the reason that I'm placing the Thief here is because during her prologue, or about the first quarter to a third of the prologue, you have some helper NPCs with you. Then for the rest of the prologue, she's on her own. Which wouldn't be a big deal, except that just like the Scholar, the Thief has no access to in kit sp restoration so you run into the same hurdles of needing to be very mindful of what abilities you're using and when and much like the scholar he is not really built for taking on groups of enemies by herself although actually so to clarify that a bit the scholar is actually better built to take on groups it's just that as i mentioned the scholar doesn't have any means of Recovering your SP naturally, so it's not a good idea to fight groups as a scholar, and it's even less of a good idea to fight groups as a thief. You can do it, it's just not really mechanically sound with this character. Once you get her to 30 AP to be able to pick up her first skill, and of the options available, I recommend either going for... HP Thief, so she has a means of HP recovery in kit, or go for Surprise Attack. Now, I I think Surprise Attack is actually a really great attack skill, but I don't really recommend taking it as the first thing that you get with her, just because it's really gear dependent, because she needs a lot of speed in order to truly take advantage of the fact that you know she's going first each turn. Because if you're not going first each turn, then Surprise Attack... Like, you know, like it still, it deals damage and it's going to deal more damage than just attacking, but it's not going to deal as much damage. Like, you know, like the, the difference between attacking first and attacking in any position other than first is pretty dramatic. So, like, uh, it's not something I recommend taking as the first thing you get with it. But with the HP Thief, you know, like you, you can recover a good amount of health each time you use it as long as you're doing something like storing up, you know, some BP so you can... You know, boost a bunch and then do a big a big HP thief while the enemy's broken. Some notable items that you can pick up during the prologue are as soon as you start off in the sewer, so as soon as like you gain control of the character after the initial battle, if you head to the right a bit, you'll find a chest that has a protective ring in it. So it's just right there, you know, just waiting for you to grab it. So you can boost your defenses a little bit. When you get to the part where you're back out in the town, there's going to be this section where you can hop in a canoe over by the little like thief headquarters place. And over in the back here, you can get her critical nut. And just like the magic nut that we got as the scholar, like these are one-time use items that permanently boost that particular attribute, which I don't recommend using when you get them. You know, just hold off until you've gathered up enough of them that you know, okay, I want to use these for this particular character, depending on how you realize you prefer building each character. And when it comes to the role actions, unlike the Scholar, I actually do recommend using the role action as the Thief, because there are quite a few items that you can grab that will either just be a benefit of getting some new good items or some good consumable items for you to take into your next major encounter, or it could just be something that's, you know, like good for selling at some point. As some notable steals that I'll recommend to grab while you're making way through town. And for some of these, yeah, I recommend like if, if the percentage isn't 100%, then I recommend saving before you do it, because if you fail, then that will affect your reputation. And in order to restore your reputation, you need to go to the local you know, tavern type place and, you know, and like, uh, and pay to uh, repair your reputation, which isn't worth doing. So I recommend just like 
you know, save before you attempt one of those and then just reload in case you happen to fail. But the ones that I recommend are when you find this little house here that has a guard out front and just blocking the door, you can steal a buckler from that guard. It's a decent defensive upgrade. If you head over to the tavern over here, there's going to be a patron who has the title of being a handyman. And from that character, you can steal a light coin pouch and a slippery nut. So, you know, so it's like a, a great grab for you to get, especially this early on. If you, when you head into like the more well-to-do area, like the kind of like high town type place, uh, there is a woman along the road here who you can get a protective earring from to match up with that ring you got earlier. And then in the weapon shop here, you can actually steal a nice weapon upgrade for the thief called the Needle Dagger and even a helmet from the tutor right over here. As I mentioned, you know, there's lots of stuff you can run around uh, looking to steal all over the place that, you know, would be good for like selling and stuff. But I'm not going to go over any of those just because, you know, like it, like it's uh, entirely dependent on what you value. And the things I've mentioned are things that are of value because by stealing these particular things, you don't need to spend money on your upgrades. And if you manage to unlock your second JP skill early on, then for the thief, you'll actually get a support skill called incidental attack, which is actually pretty good. Uh, with incidental attack, if you were to use steel or one of the non attacking skills. So if you were to use something like, uh, like one of the debuffs, one of the debuffing skills, then it wouldn't be like a waste of a turn potentially. Like, you know, like if your if your goal is to be dealing damage, then you could do one of these things and still deal damage during that turn. It's not a guaranteed thing, but you know it's better than you know just doing one of those things without having this equipped. Unless of course your op your goal is to not deal damage with her. Yeah, and that's, so that's it for the thief. So moving on. Next up is the cleric. Now to be absolutely honest, it guts me to have the cleric this low on the list. I would love to put them higher. It's just mechanically the next four just prevent me from being able to rank the cleric any higher than they are on the list. But like the cleric, in my opinion, has the best opening out of all the characters. I'm not going to put, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm not putting any spoilers in here. So like you know, you'll see on your own eventually why it is that, you know, like the cleric is my favorite opening. But like this, it like it hurts me to be able to <laughs> to not be able to say that this is like one of the like the main ones I recommend getting. But unfortunately, they just they just can't rank higher than here, despite the fact that they really have a lot of great things going for them in their prologue. Starting off, the Oprah NPC that they get they get almost right away. And even though you know the cleric NPC themselves are the healer here because they're the cleric. The helper that they get is actually a very capable helper. They have a ton of health. They can do pretty good damage. And they have some good offensive and defensive options to keep the heat off of your cleric. And once you gather up 30 JP and you're able to do your first ability purchase, I 100% recommend getting the Mystical Staff ability. Even though, yeah, it'd be nice to grab Luminance for the... Or, sorry, Luminescence for the area damage like you cannot beat the utility of mystical staff this is a physical attack using their staff that deals a tremendous amount of damage like honestly it is ridiculous how much damage this thing deals plus you are restoring sp based on the damage you dealt with this attack so you can just go around you know using any any skill you want in any in any combat and then you know, uh, build up some some BP so that you can boost and do a big mystical staff to get all of your SP back. It is amazing. Like, you, know, like, like, you cannot stop this character when they get going. And their latent power even allows them to do something that none of the other characters can. Well, I'm not going to say none of the other characters can do this. Because there is one other as the Basically, the characters after that I have ranked after this can do this particular thing but not in the same way that the cleric can. The cleric is able to, whatever 
weakness an enemy has. The cleric is able to ignore that and just hit them for shield breaking damage. So even if the enemy isn't weak against a staff, you can attack them as though they were. And since mystical staff attacks twice, if they have two shield up, then you're able to just break them immediately. And while that isn't a huge, huge thing, keep in mind that the cleric is also the only character. And I can say this having played through the prologue with everyone except the warrior multiple times. The cleric is the only one who once you finish the prologue and you go out into their first starting area, who I had run into a cape. I didn't have them run into a cape once. I had them run into a cape two times, almost back to back. Meaning that this is an area where there's a good chance of running into Kates. And if you played Octopath Traveler, you may recall that Kates are the enemy that lets you farm a tremendous amount of job points. Now the issue here is that Kates also have a very high speed and evasion. So if you ever played the Dragon Quest, so if you haven't played Octopath Traveler, but you have played the Dragon Quest games, it's like a metal sign. You know, like they, it, they're very hard to hit. When you do hit them, they take very little damage. And when their turn comes around, there's a very high likelihood they're just going to run away. But what makes the cleric uniquely suited for fighting these things is that if you do manage to hit them, you can use their latent power with their mystical staff to just immediately break them because they have two guard. And if you can break them, then that means you can kill them. So they have the highest likelihood of actually being able to take out a eight on their own. Some interesting items that you can pick up while doing the cleric's prologue are when you leave the first town that you're in and you get to like this cave area. If you head to the right here, you can take a canoe over to the back where you will find a stimulating ring. So just, you know, another nice boost to their SP. If you head the other way in that same cave and head out onto this little bluff here, you'll find another chest that has a tough nut in it. And then when you're down in the kind of sewer area and you get to this statue here, behind the statue and to, through the back is a little secret passage that gets you the Pilgrim Rod, which is a nice upgrade for Eric. Also, while not really beneficial to anything as far as the prologue goes, I am a big fan of the way that their uh, row action works. Like being able to, because you know, because basically this cleric is an inquisitor. So, <laughs> so you can just run around and put people to the question. And unlike the way that doing this works with other characters, the only thing you need to accomplish as the cleric is to break the break their opponent. So as long as you're able to exploit this character's weakness. To get them to break, you will accomplish your goal to get whatever, whatever information that they have. And I just think that that's like a really awesome blend of gameplay and narrative. Like you know, like I like, like, like all the other all the other characters who can do something similar to this. Like you know, like I actually made me sad that you know, like that the, the, they don't have something like this, where it's like so like like so entrenched in who this character is that they're able to do this thing. Yeah, so once again, you know, like I like I've been gushing on this character and for good reason because I really I love the cleric. I think the cleric is one of the best. And you would not be wrong for picking them. It's just that when it comes to like the ease of like what the others that you do, like I like uh you're gonna see that the others just offer things that make them just hugely effective in comparison to the cleric. But I mean, of like out of the scholar, thief, and cleric, like the cleric blows the other two out of the water. You know, they do not hold a candle to the cleric. If you and also if you manage to get the cleric to 100 JP to unlock their next skill, then you also unlock their support skill, which is resilience. And this is once again, it's not a great support skill. All it does is it increases the amount of healing. Whoever it has this support skill will be equipped receives, which I'm sure that later in the game, this is probably a great thing to have so that you can make, you know, uh, lower tier healing spells more effective or even make, you know, just using basic items more effective. 
on a particular character that has a lot of health and that you don't want to spend a lot of time healing, you know, because they have so much health. But early on, like, you know, using the healing skill that this character starts with, like, I don't see any reason for having, you know, even bothering to equip this support skill. I mean, it's not like there's anything wrong with, with equipping it. You can put it on and it's not going to hurt you having it on, but it's not going to give you any benefit either because, you know, like, if you can't heal yourself up to where you want to be using <laughs> using the healing spell with this character, then that means that you're about to die. <laughs> and it doesn't matter that you have this on. <laughs> yeah, but that's it for the cleric. Moving on. Next up is the dancer. So the dancer at first might seem like one of the more underpowered units. And in many ways she is. However... This is actually a very powerful start for this game for a few reasons. First is that the dancer's row action is very similar to the way the thief works, except that there's no chance and failure of it. So as long as you meet the level requirement for whatever the item is you're going for, you can just grab it. Just every character you see, you know, if, if the th little icon pops up, just walk up to them have them give you stuff and there's no harm no foul in using this system as much as you please i'm not even going to bother recommending anything to grab just because like, there's no reason not to just grab everything on your way out the dancer also gets access to an incredibly useful helper npc so this npc think of how the fuel bot worked for the scholar Except imagine if it was actually useful. Imagine, if you would, that the helper NPC actually restored SP. Because this one does. This one is able to do both. They can heal the dancer and they can restore her SP. There's no reason for you to ever hold back on using her skills. Once you have accrued 30 JP for her, then the two options that I recommend for picking up Heritage Sweeping Gale or Dagger Dance, both are very good for her. I kind of recommend Sweeping Gale over Dagger Dance simply for the purpose that it is an element that you can add to her repertoire and having elements is always a good idea. Whereas Dagger Dance, you know, is still doing the same weapon damage that her base attack does. It just does it to a group, which is, you know, obviously very good to have, especially if it's a group that is weak against Dagger Dance. But having that extra element can be a good idea. Although, because of the skill that this character starts with, it isn't hugely necessary, especially considering that the way that the dancer's latent power works make it that she can use her skill that simply ignores any enemy weakness and just exploits a weakness regardless of what she has. You, know, you can use her kick to just you know, knock off a shield off of anything. And with her latent power, you can just do it to a whole group. So, you know, it's really, it's all about, you know, what do you feel is the most value with her? But, you know, personally, I recommend the wind skill, then the group skill. And then the other stuff, you know, you grab later. Just because, you know, there's no real need for any of that this early in the game. Some items to be on the lookout for during her prologue. Are when you enter this area here where there is like kind of a hut in the distance go down into the canoe area and just go all the way out all the way past this hut here all the way to the next screen and on this little island here you will find a sprightly ring and on your way through the forest here just uh, head down this little tree slope thing here and you'll find a slippery nut and once you have completed her prologue just hop in the canoe over here head up the river and there is a round shield in this chest right there and those will be some good items to get and if you get her to her second skill choice that will unlock her first support skill which is the show goes on which extends the duration of buffs which i'm sure will be really useful later on but at the moment you know isn't isn't the most useful thing however what is incredibly useful with the dancer and the reason that I place her above the cleric is that they, both her and the cleric can go and, and get villagers to follow them around. However, when 
the cleric does it, it's just to have someone with them who has some extra like skill that might be useful, like maybe a buff or an extra heal or something like that. But for the dancer, they not only get that basic part of having a follower with them, they also get the dance sessions. Now, dance sessions are a passive ability that only occur in battle when you when the dancer is using her dance skills, but only at night. However, once you finish the prologue, you're able to change what time of day it is whenever you want. So something incredibly powerful you can do, you can run up to this NPC right here who has this dance session that makes it that when you're doing a dance, she just restores SP and then just go out into the world. And now you have, as long as you're, as you have it at night, anytime your dancer dances, she gets her ASP restored. So everything's free. <laughs> it's incredible value. And there's no reason not to do this. Obviously, like, you know, there's plenty of other options. You can find some that uh, will, will give you different kinds of buffs. You can find some that enhance other, other facets of gameplay. But, you know, uh, to me, like early on, the most valuable thing is being able to just instantly restore your SP whenever you feel like it. Now that's it for the dancer. And now we come to the apothecary. So this was actually a ranking that I fought with myself quite a bit on. Because originally I had the apothecary where the cleric was. So basically I had it cleric, dancer, apothecary. But upon reflection, like I realized that there's a value to the apothecary that skyrockets her above the above all of the other characters earlier on this list and it all revolves around her latent power so as the apothecary he is able to combine various herbs together either in a healing fashion or in a harming fashion to do various things however like obviously you have to consume these different herbs in order to do those things what her latent power does is it makes it that she doesn't consume anything when she does that. But once you have access to her latent power, you can just add whenever you want, as long as she has that, you know, her latent power available, you can make it that you can recover the entire party's status if they happen to get hit by a nasty status effect, if they happen to be low on health, if they happen to be low on SP. She can go and recover all of that in one turn or free you know like you can go and if you're ran into an enemy and you're really worried about what status is or not status is about what weaknesses it has you can just have her hit all of them <laughs> in one turn or free <laughs> like she is a ridiculous unit to bring around with you and early on she actually gets access to really nice equipment so in particular once you are able to go and start healing people at night, you can head over to the lighthouse here, chemically induce the lighthouse keeper, head up to the top, and you get a very nice axe upgrade for her. If you head down in the canoe to this house right over here on the west end of town, you can find this chest right here that has resistant nut in it. When you've left the town and you're heading down the path here, there's like a little hidden path along the way that you're seeing here and at the end of that you'll find an empowering ring which gives you just it's an accessory that just, just, just gives you a ton of health then when you get onto the bridge here all the way at the end over here you get a guard's helm which is a great defensive upgrade and then after you've completed the prologue and you've headed out into the world you'll see that there's like a a chest down in the lake here so just go on down hop in the canoe go all the way around and in there, you will find a very good bow, which makes her like a great option to go either from her straight to the hunter or straight to the merchant. Either way is a great option if you decided to go and pick up that bow on the way. Once you've accrued 30 JP and you have access to her skills, uh, the only skill I recommend picking up for her is the Sweeping Cleave. Just because, you know, it's a axe attack against the entire enemy party. And everything else she has access to isn't anywhere near as useful as what I mentioned about the way her concoctions work. But an interesting thing about her 
Is it the same way that the cleric is able to question people for information? She can just go and ask people for information. And many times when you do that, they'll just tell you, oh, there's an item somewhere. And then you'll see it show, you'll see, it won't show up on the map, but you'll see like on the screen, like a blue, a blue glowing thing kind of sparkle. You just run up to it and that'll be the item that they were talking about. A lot of times it'll be right next to them. Sometimes it'll be further away. But, you know, you can get some free items that way with her. I mean, like nothing that I found in the prologue is really worth doing that for. Like, it's just extra items, but definitely worth doing. However, something that whether or not you choose to start with the apothecary, I recommend that every town you go to, make sure that you get any available herbs possible. Anything you see, even if it's just one, even if like you can only afford to get one of each. Make sure you're grabbing all of the herbs that you're seeing. Like, not the stuff that is like a direct use thing, but like the stuff that's for her. So if it looks like like a, like a an envelope of something, you know, like a tincture, a tincture kind of thing. Like anything like that, like you want to grab immediately because those are the materials she needs for her concoctions. So, you know, obviously picking those up is a great boon for this character. Definitely worth getting. And if you were to go and get her JP all the way to 100 after picking up that first skill, you get her to 100 to get her second skill, then you will get the best of the, uh, yeah, actually, uh, honestly, of of the seven characters that I ran through the prologue with, this is the best of all of the support skills because she gets access to Vigorous Victor, which makes it that if you have this support skill equipped, then you just recover your HP and SP at the end of combat. Not all of it, but 30%, which is a good amount. Basically, like, you make it that, you know, everything's free. <laughs> yeah, it's just, like, that. That's what, this is why, like, you know, like, it, it was tough for me to, to go and rank her as high as I have. Because, you know, like, I like the dancer and the cleric so much. But, you know, like, you can see, like, there's just too much value in the way this character works. For me not to consider this just the more powerful easier to get going start than the other two have because she's just a massive beef tank that has huge utility <laughs> yeah so simply said you know this is a fantastic character that's it for the apothecary moving on to the hunter this is without question the best combatant of all of the characters period hands down i don't care what options you get as the warrior it is not topping what the hunter can do Matter of fact, during the opening cutscene as this character, you get an option. You can pick this kind of fox looking thing or this owl. I recommend the owl because what getting the owl does is it makes it that you can exploit any elemental weakness. And I'm not saying it has a possibility that it'll exploit an elemental weakness. An elemental weakness. That's what it does. It specifically targets an elemental weakness, regardless of if you know what it is. So she can just go, okay, I don't know what this is, but exploit its weakness. And it does it. You know, like if you pick the fox one, then it'll exploit a weapon weakness. Which is the reason why, like, I, I think there's more value in the owl. Because during the prologue, I didn't find any monsters that you could capture that would make it that you could gain additional elements. Like you could, I found quite a few of different weapon types, which, you know, makes it that, you know, that you can have her exploit any kind of weapon weakness very easily, even without picking this one. So I just, I think that the owl is the better choice. Also, just like the, uh, not the pot here, just like the dancer and the cleric, the hunter also gets access to a follower option, but it, I think this only works for her people. Like I didn't find any humans I could do this with. So I think it's specific to her people, like you run into another beast, uh, I think they're called beastings or beastlings, uh, then you can make friends with them. Actually, you know what, actually, there's probably, like since the way that the owl and that other pet work, uh, when you're giving that choice at the start of the game, like you use that same system to make friends with them. So I'm guessing, you know, like probably like her people and you'll probably find some like beast NPCs throughout the game that you can also do this with. and. And so, like, you can, along with her actual, just mechanical hunting stuff that makes it that you can summon 
monsters. She also has a separate, you know, follower thing that lets her also do that. I mean, but it's obviously not as good as the dancers because the dancers, there's a benefit aside from the summoning. But for her, like, it's like the, how the cleric works where, like, you know, you get that benefit of having the follower, but they aren't as useful in other ways like the dancers followers are. Also, when catching monsters in this one, it is actually very different than it was in the last one. Before, the way that the monsters worked, you had like your basic monsters or when you caught them, you know, you were able to use them to differing <laughs> for differing values, but you had a limit to how many times you could use them with the exception of the one that you started the game with. In this one, all of the monsters you catch, you're able to use as much as you want. The difference is that you are able to prepare them. And what that does is you basically butcher the monster you caught and turn it into an item. And the reason you would want to do this is that there is a, a unique economy for, oh, actually, let me put some more context here. The reason you'd want to do this during the hunter's prologue is that there is a unique economy with her village that makes it that you can just go and like hunt a bunch of these frogs here, get some a uh, bunch of beef jerky, and then get a bunch of these particular gear upgrades that you could give to all of the other party members when you run into them. You know, it's a great way to gear up the rest of the crew just by farming up these materials with this character. And I definitely recommend doing that just because these are really good. You're going to see fantastic gear upgrades. Uh, the loot that I recommend keeping out for during the prologue are from where you start out. If you go behind this little ruin part here and up top, you'll get an unerring ring. While inside of the story dungeon that you have to go through, you'll find this kind of like land bridge thing here. When you go down and through it or under it, you'll find a composite bow with at the end, a nice weapon upgrade for her. and then after you've completed the prologue and you have access to the human village part the guy over at the tower here you can provoke into combat and once you knock him out you can climb to the top and get yourself a giant bow from there which is a weapon that's actually very expensive if you try to buy it once you've accrued around 30 jp as his character you'll have access to her, 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 her abilities and the only skill that I recommend getting it for her is Mercy Strike. Because what Mercy Strike does is it makes it more likely that you'll be able to catch an enemy. Because the way catching works is, is command rules. So the less HP they have, the more likely you are to successfully catch them. And Mercy Strike makes it that you can't kill them with the attack. That's definitely the skill I recommend. If you were to go all the way to uh, her second skill and unlock her support skill, would get heightened senses which increases the chance that you attack first in battle but you know obviously that's good to have i don't rank it as high as the apothecary sports skill but it's better than the other ones that's it for the hunter and finally we come to the best and brightest as far as i'm concerned the merchant is absolutely my favorite of all of the protagonists first off he fits all the criteria i'm looking for in the grp protagonist which is that he is a light-hearted individual who isn't lighthearted for the sake of, oh, I need to be this way in order to keep the darkness at bay. Oh, I need to be this way in order to live up to the expectations of so-and-so. Oh, I need to be this way because of this or that. He's just a really happy-go-lucky guy because he's a really happy-go-lucky guy. It's who he's always been, and you get to see that, and it's great. He is my favorite, bar none. That said... Mechanically, he is also the best character, period. <laughs> he is not able to exploit weaknesses like some of the other characters can. He can't do that. What he can do is heal for free whenever he wants. Every round, you can just go, oh, I'm just going to take a little rest here. Thanks for waiting. I shall smack you now. <laughs> It is the best support skill ever. <laughs> and you don't have to buy into it. He just starts with it. He just has it. Yeah, doesn't have to earn it. He just has that on him right from the get-go. And to top it off, he has access to 
the best skill in the game, Arrow of Fortune. Now, the description of Arrow of Fortune is kind of misleading, so I'll explain the way it works, so that way, like, you know, you can just, you know, get going on the best foot. It does not deal damage based on... I'm sorry. It does not give you JP based on the amount of damage you deal. It gives you JP based on the amount of health that was, I guess, diffused with the attack. So let me explain what I mean there. Uh, if you were to get an enemy down to low health and use this, then you would get one extra JP for the attack. Because it's not based on the actual damage dealt by the attack. It's uh, based on you know how much of the damage from the attack was actually you know actually affected the health of the enemy. So like once it hits zero, and you know, once the enemy's health hits zero, anything beyond that is not being offered to the bonus. So in order to get the most out of this, you actually want to use it while the enemy is at max health. You don't want to soften them up. You want to just save up your BP and do the biggest arrow fortune possible right off the bat. Like you don't like no like you know, and since you know his whole thing is that he can just you know recover every single round. You never have to worry about running out of SP. And you never have to worry about being too low on health and needing to like use an item or something to recover or go back to town to you know heal up. You can just stay out there farming it up as long as you want to. And you can get through this real fast. Like you know, like I can literally I've done uh, the merchants prologue at least three times now. And you know, you can get the first skill with him in three battles. Is that is that fast? You know, like you literally just three battles and you already have enough to get the first skill. And by the way, like uh skill wise, I only recommend getting collect. Like there's nothing else in his kit that really is worth getting like yeah like you get his fire skill but like i said you know you don't want him to be using anything other than arrow of fortune because arrow of fortune is what's going to make it that you're able to crush the the jp barriers as quickly as possible uh, in terms of a uh, support skill he just gets a skill that increases the amount of uh, money you get at the end of battle which you know like isn't a huge thing but it isn't bad as a matter of fact, you know, like using the collect skill along with that support skill uh, when fighting this particular encounter right here. And this is the only encounter in the prologue that I recommend. Oh, the only one of the random encounters I recommend using collect on uh, this uh, this rank two mole guy here. When you collect from, oh, you know, obviously if you want to save up your BP, do a full boost collect which will give you a 95 percent chance if you haven't hurt it at all it'll give you a 95 percent chance to successfully collect and when you collect you'll get 168 money and at the end of combat if you have this port skill you'll get an additional 90 money so you know so about 250 of the money per combat well i guess closer to 260 of the money per combat and you know again <laughs> you wonder why i'm going through the effort of explaining that. And that's because, and let me preface this, I am not recommending you do what I'm about to say. I am simply pointing out that this is something you can do. Not saying you should do it. I'm saying you can do it. <laughs> and that is that during the first section of the prologue, well, not the first section, the second section of the prologue for the merchant, there will be items available in the shop in the weapon shop that are only there during that part of the prologue as soon as you advance the story at all and you know that goes away you know like uh, so you can't get this shield anymore you can't get this bow anymore and those are removed entirely uh, this sword is also removed but like you know like that you know a, uh, a weapon that reduces your accuracy by that much i don't see value in that <laughs> but uh the, you can farm during this section with the merchant to try to get uh, the shield and the bow. And, you know, like, so, like, I did the math on it. Like, you you only need to get to around 24, 25,000 in order to get them. 
which I know sounds like stupid math because <laughs> you're, you're seeing the prices there. And those two combined are obviously way more than 24, 25,000. But the reason that it, you only need about 24, 25,000 in order to get those is because the way that the merchant works is like how the dancer works, except that his stuff is for commerce and not for combat. So you have, you know, characters all around town and you can use his role action to pay the, to pay somebody to join him in the same fashion that the cleric, the dancer and the hunter can, except that along with the summoning stuff that all the rest of them do, what his guys do is they give you extra benefits for anything involving monetary exchange. So, you know, there's a guy that, you know, like when you go to the inn, you know, he'll wash all the, he'll wash the dishes for you so that, you know, when, you know, when you rest there, whatever you spent on healing at the inn, you know, you just get that refunded. You know, there's people who get you discounts or people who get you bonuses on selling. There's people who uh, make it that you can collect more money in combat, you know, like all kinds of stuff like that. But in particular, during the prologue, and then with uh, with this guy over here, you know, he has a 5% chance to get you 50% off any item. So, you know, so once you sell the thing you need to sell, just, you know, recruit this guy here, and you're able, like, and, like you are able to use him to get you both of these items for that, you know, that 24, 25,000 range that I mentioned. But here's the thing about that. So you can see that I don't have any footage of me doing that. And the reason I don't have any footage of me doing that is because you can only play the demo for a maximum of three hours. And in order to get 25,000 money, you need to be playing for more than that. <laughs> like I did the math. If you're lucky, like if you're very lucky, then you can, you can get the money you need in about maybe four hours. If you're very lucky and when i say very lucky i'm talking like every battle every other battle is against the the mole enemy that i said is uh, worth uh using collect on you know because all the other ones are not worth it like you know like you're you know like you're losing out on profit like by actually stopping to fight anything else i mean not stopping to fight but stopping to collect from anything else it's just wasted time you're better off just you know throw them out right with your you know, with your fully charged arrow of fortune and move on like, you know it's only worth doing with this enemy and obviously with the boss in the prologue but you know like the section that leads to the boss in the prologue is after the point where those items stop being available so it's only when only the very first time you enter this area here is the only time that you can farm up the money necessary to be able to do this now, the other items you're seeing here, like the silver sword, uh, the feather cap, the, you know, like, like the traveling clothes, like, like these things, they'll still be there when you do the rest of the prologue. So that's fine. You don't have to worry about those. And you can come back for those later. But if you really want these items, and obviously, you know, this shield, like basically anyone who puts on this shield isn't going to take damage until like, like you get to like chapter three content, you know? <laughs> like this is going to carry you a very long way if you choose to do this. And this bow here, this bow is going to guarantee that you are getting the most out of your arrow of fortune every single time. Mind you, there are reasons to keep the merchant's arrow damage lower, since if you do a max, uh, a max BP boosted arrow of fortune, then you can get you can get like you know like the maximum value out of it multiple times so like you know like the uh the prologue boss for the merchant you can end up getting around 60 total jp from that fight as long as you're using that like only using the arrow fortune and not doing anything else well i mean like you can use collect on on everything in that bot on that battle but as long as you're using arrow fortune as the only way that you're attacking then you'll end up with about 60 JP from that combat. You know, like it's ridiculous value compared to everything else when it comes to how you're, you know, accruing the JP in this game. Like you guaranteed will have 
uh, at least up you'll uh, you'll have made it to a support skill by the time you get to that boss i guarantee it but yeah that is my recommendation yeah warrior not really ranked because i didn't actually play as him but i'm assuming it's gonna be tough scholar as the toughest that i came across then thief then cleric then dancer then apothecary then hunter and finally merchant hopefully this helps you with your decision when you get the game i really hope that whatever you pick that it, you have a great time with it because honestly this is a very good game i'm definitely chomping at the bit to play it but it's gonna, like i said it's gonna be a while till i get to it oh my backlog <laughs> anyway that's gonna be it for me if you enjoyed this video appreciate sharing it with anyone who you think may find it useful please do all the youtube stuff like comment subscribe and until next time bay victus Fires and Omeris, and bye.